Israel's Unbelief in Prophecy and Mystery by Eric Newman Chapter 21 21 Paul continues to be warned by the Holy Spirit that he will be bound and suffer trouble if he goes to Jerusalem v. 11. However, Paul is ready to die at Jerusalem if need be v. 13. Once there, Paul finds out he is not welcomed. First, the saved Jews of Israel's program does not like him being there since he is of a different dispensation, verses 20 to 25. Then, the religious Jews beat him and would have killed him if the Romans did not put a stop to it, verses 31 to 32. 21 colon 1 16 These verses show Paul stopping at a few cities and praying with them, since he knows he will not be seeing them again. Paul was not stopping there, so they would pray for him to be safe in travel, as Christianity today would have done. Rather, he was praying for them that they would not allow false doctrine to take people away from the truth. 20 colon 28 dash 32. 21 colon 4 Paul said in 2023 that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. This witness continues here. The Holy Ghost is not forbidding Paul to go to Jerusalem like he forbade Paul to preach in Asia in 16 colon 6. Rather, the Holy Ghost says that he should not go to Jerusalem because of the persecution that awaits him there, and the Jews in Jerusalem have already rejected the gospel of grace. Yet, because Paul's heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, Romans 10 verse 1, Paul is ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus, 21 13. This shows the freedom that we have in Christ. Even as the apostle of the Gentiles, specifically commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven to preach the gospel to everyone, 9 15, Paul still had the liberty to go where he wanted to go. How much more, then, do we have the liberty in Christ to live and do what we want to today? God does not treat us like weaned children, Psalm 131 verse 2, who have to follow the Lord's leading in all circumstances. Rather, he treats us like adult sons, Galatians 4 verses 6 to 7, with the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16, giving us the ability to think through things and make decisions using that mind. It should also be noted that, the fact, that every city has people proclaiming through the Holy Spirit the afflictions that await Paul in Jerusalem, means that Jesus has given prophets to every city to speak for the Lord, since the Bible is not complete yet. The prophets, then, are not just confined to the Old Testament, Ephesians 4 verse 11, as Christianity would have you believe, but they continued until the entire Bible was completed, Ephesians 4 verses 12 to 13. 21 colon 5 Although we are not told the prayer that they prayed, you can bet that it was not for traveling mercies for Paul, since Paul did not count his life dear to him, 2024. All knew that he would suffer in Jerusalem, and yet Paul was praying for them that they would not stray from the mystery and the sound doctrine contained in it, in spite of the attacks of the adversary through the Judaizers and other false religion. When they prayed for Paul, it was probably that the gospel might be believed by the Jews in Jerusalem. The point is that, if we set our affections on things above, Colossians 3 verse 2, then our prayers will be for the spiritual, rather than for the physical for which Christianity today usually prays. 21 to 8-9 When 21 to 8 says that Philip was one of the seven, it refers back to 6 to 5 where there were seven men appointed to take care of the daily ministration of the widows. Therefore, Philip was a believer in Israel's kingdom program. This would have been the same Philip who preached in Samaria, 8 5, and preached to the Ethiopian eunuch, 8 27, since we last heard that he was in Caesarea, 8 40. Since there are still believers in Israel's program around and the dispensation of grace is going to the Jew first, Romans 1 verse 16, we cannot really say which program Philip's four daughters were prophets of. 21 11, if I were Paul, and I was told that the man that owneth this girdle shall be bound and delivered to the Gentiles, I would have taken that girdle to the nearest thrift store and donated it for free. Seriously though, 
This is Paul's final warning that he will be bound if he goes to Jerusalem, and the warning comes from someone who came down from Judea, 21:10. Today, Christians try to be led by the Spirit by praying and seeking God's guidance on what they should do. Then, they seek for confirmation from others and from circumstances that what the Holy Spirit has been speaking to their heart is true. Then, they follow what they believe the Holy Spirit wants them to do. However, today, since we have God's completed word, Colossians 1 verse 25, God does not speak to us in this manner. Even if he did, God still gives us the liberty to make our own decisions, Galatians 5 verse 1. Paul's circumstances are a great example of this. In 2023, Paul said that the Holy Ghost testified in every city that bonds and afflictions abide him. Christians, today, would say that that is God's way of saying that Paul should not go to Jerusalem. However, Paul says that none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, 2024. Now, he gets a specific prophecy from the Holy Ghost that he will be bound by the Jews and delivered to jail, and he still does not back down. This shows that God gives us the free will to make our own decisions, and, we could say, that choosing persecution for Christ is probably the best decision, as Jesus and Paul both made that same choice, not counting their physical lives dear to themselves. 21,12-13 Everyone, including Luke and Silas, tells Paul not to go to Jerusalem, because they are concerned for his safety. However, Paul's love for Israel is so great that he could wish he were accursed from Christ for the salvation of Israel, Romans 9, 3-4a. Therefore, he says, I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus, 21 13. Paul does not count his life dear, 2024, since to live is Christ, and to die is gain, Philippians 1 verse 21. Sadly, so very few Christians today have the same attitude. 2114, the will of the Lord be done, does not mean that God wants Paul to be bound and afflicted. The will of the Lord is for all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. Therefore, what they are saying is that since Paul is determined to go to Jerusalem and since Paul will go there to try to win Jews for Christ, they pray that men might be saved by Paul's preaching to them, in spite of the fact that he will be bound and put in jail. 21.16 Every word in the Bible is there for a reason. There must be a reason, then, that we are told that they were going to lodge with an old disciple named Nason. It is interesting that, although the brethren received them gladly when they got to Jerusalem, 21.17, the brethren did not let him stay with them. In fact, the brethren seem like they are a little jealous. They ask him to take Jews into the temple, to have their heads shaved for the Nazarite vow they had, 21, 23-24. This may have led to Paul's arrest, as we will see later. Therefore, the note that Paul was going to stay with Nason may be here to tell us that the kingdom saints in Jerusalem do not care too much for Paul. 21, 17-18 The Brethren in Jerusalem received them gladly. Then, the next day, they met with the elders in Jerusalem. 21, 19-21, the elders in Jerusalem. Do not appear glad to see Paul. When Paul told them of the great things going on with the Gentiles, they did not say, that's great, Paul. We sure are glad to see the Lord saving the Gentiles. Instead, they put the focus back on themselves, saying how many thousands of Jews there are which believe. It is as if they are trying to match Paul. Paul tells of the Gentiles being saved, and they say, well, we've got many thousands of Jews who are saved, too. Note that they say that the Jewish believers are all zealous of the law. The book of Acts is almost over, and they are bragging about being zealous of the law. Paul wrote the book of Romans around 20 1-3 and said that we are not under the law, but under grace, Romans 6 verse 14. This shows the two different dispensations still going on at the time. Those today who say that a new dispensation began at Acts 2 need only look at 2120 to see that many saved individuals are still in Israel's kingdom. Program that started back in Genesis 12. 
There are still many thousands of people saved under the Kingdom program that the Jewish apostles are in charge of edifying. Under the Kingdom program, they are still under the law, therefore, they are zealous of the law. Paul, though, preaching the gospel of grace is preaching that people are not under the law. Now, you can see why the Jewish brethren are not really happy to see Paul. He is preaching a different gospel than they are, and they are worried that he will cause those still under the law to stumble and not follow the law due to Paul's grace message. It is like two worlds are colliding here. 21, 20-21 The Jews, zealous of the law in 2120, are correct in being zealous of it, because they were saved in Israel's program. The Jews, in 2121, who have forsaken the law of Moses, are also correct in forsaking it because they were saved in the mystery program. The Jews, in 2120, were saved by going back under God's law covenant and being water baptized. The Jews, in 2121, were saved by trusting in the blood of Christ as atonement for their sins and are under grace, not under the law. Therefore, both are correct in their respective programs. 21-22-24 The elders, in Jerusalem, propose a solution for the colliding worlds of law and grace. They have four men, who have taken a Nazarite vow, which is something that is clearly under God's law covenant with Israel. Number 6. The elders suggest that Paul go with them to the temple, since Paul had also already taken a Nazarite vow himself, 1818. That way, the Jews zealous for the law will see Paul follow the law and not be offended by his liberty in Christ. This act by Paul goes along with his statement in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 20, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Thus, James wants Paul to take these men so that the saved Jews in Israel's program is not offended by Paul, but Paul agrees to do this so that it may open up the opportunity for Paul to share the gospel of grace with the unbelieving Jews at Jerusalem. 21, 25, James and the elders at Jerusalem remind Paul of how, at the previous Jerusalem council, he asked the Gentiles to live so that they also will not offend Jews saved in the kingdom program, 15, 19-20. This is not a case of Paul submitting to the authority of James, because Paul has already been given his authority by the Lord Jesus Christ to preach to all unsaved people, 9.15. Rather, this is Paul respecting saved Jews in Israel's program so that they will not stumble and will continue to be zealous of the Mosaic law that they are under in their dispensation. 2126 Paul fulfills the request of the Jerusalem elders by having his head shaved, along with the four men, to show the saved Jews that he is obeying the law. 2. Paul put himself under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 20. The Nazarite vow was a voluntary separation unto the Lord. All the days of the vow of his separation there shall no razor come upon his head, until the days be fulfilled in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall be holy, and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. Number 6, colon 5. This is why Samson had long hair, because he had been a Nazarite from birth, Judges 13 verse 5. When the days of separation are over, the Nazarite shall shave the head of his separation, number 618. This is what went on with Paul and these four men. Paul had a Nazarite vow back in 1818. Now, he has his head shaved, because he has chosen to end his days of separation. He then stays in the temple until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. 21-27-28 According to number 6-10-11, it appears that he needed to stay in the temple for seven days. Then, on the eighth day, he would offer an offering, and his days of separation would be officially over. What happens instead, though, is that Jews have followed him all the way from Asia, and they forcefully remove him from the temple. They stir up the people by saying that Paul hath polluted this holy place by bringing Gentiles into the temple. Paul had done no such thing. Paul had separated himself unto God under the law with the Nazarite vow, and he had brought four Jews with him, who were also under a Nazarite vow. 
The fact, though, that these Jews remove him from the temple before his sacrifice can be made means that they are the ones guilty of polluting the temple, not Paul, because they have interrupted the days of separation for a Nazarite required under the law. Therefore, the Jews are guilty of the very accusation they have falsely hurled at Paul. Just like when Jesus was arrested, Paul's arrest is handled very unlawfully by those who supposedly judge according to the law. This shows that these religious Jews really hate the truth of God's word so much that they compass land and sea to hunt down Paul and arrest him unlawfully because they have no lawful means by which they can arrest him. It is ironic that they accuse Paul of teaching men everywhere against the law, when Paul was there solely because he was keeping the law, and they, by interrupting his Nazarite vow, have taught the Jews, by example, to disobey the very Mosaic law that they supposedly protect. 2129 The Jews' allegation against Paul, that he brought Gentiles into the temple, was based on the fact that they saw him associating with Gentiles outside the temple, but Paul never broke Jewish law by bringing them into the part of the temple that a Gentile was forbidden from going into. 2130, their accusation should have seemed comical to the Jews. After all, he was almost at the end of seven days of purification with four other Jews in the temple. How could he teach against the people, the law, and the temple? 2128, when he has been with Jews for seven days, obeying the law in the temple. But men love the praise of men more than the praise of God, John 12 verse 43. Therefore, the Jews completely disregard God's law, kick Paul out of the temple, and want to kill him. 21, 31-32 There is no justice in the traditions of the Jews, as they are beating Paul and wanting to kill him without a trial, which is against God's law, Deuteronomy 19 verses 15-21. They would have succeeded if the Romans did not interfere here and stop them from beating up Paul. How ironic that God made Israel to be above the Gentiles as an example to them, Deuteronomy 7 verse 6, and it takes the Gentiles interfering in the matter to keep Israel from unjustly killing God's apostle, Romans 11 verse 13, 21 33 from 22 29, the implication is that it was against the law for an uncondemned Roman to be bound with a chain, but the chief captain does not know, at this point, that Paul is a Roman, 2229. However, considering that the Jews were about to kill Paul, it was a good thing that the chief captain interfered. 21, 34-36, religion sure is an ugly thing. Paul cannot give his defense to the chief captain here because the people keep yelling and arguing that he should be killed. The soldiers even have to carry him to protect him because the Jews cry away with him. This is also what they cried against the Lord Jesus Christ when they had him crucified, Luke 23 verse 18. Pilate asked why he should be crucified, but he never got an answer. Instead, the Jews used loud voices to insist that he be crucified, Luke 23 verses 22 to 23. Thus, the Jews' treatment of Paul, here, is much like their treatment of Jesus, to be crucified. The heathen think that for their much. Speaking and loud insistence that the truth will be snuffed out, Matthew 6 verse 7. However, nothing can be done against the truth, but only for the truth, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 8. 21 38 Israel were God's chosen people. Therefore, they were supposed to be holy, 1 Peter 1 verse 16. Jerusalem was the capital city, where God had promised he would set up his throne and rule over the earth forever, Psalm 48 verses 1 to 2 and Revelation 11 verse 15. Because of this, it is called the holy city. Yet, the Jews had so corrupted Israel, and especially Jerusalem, with their religious traditions that this verse says that there were at least 4,000 murderers living there. God's law says that murderers are to be killed, Numbers 35, 16-18 and Deuteronomy 19 verse 21. However, the Jews were not following God's law. They were following man's traditions. Therefore, Jerusalem was so exceedingly wicked that one man had recently led 4,000 murders out of there. If Israel had executed the murderers in the first place, this never would have happened. 
21:39, Paul tells them that he is from Tarsus, which is not a mean city. The implication is that Jerusalem, instead of being the holy city, is now a mean city, thanks to the Jewish traditions that had replaced God's law. 2140, the chief captain now knows that Paul can speak both Greek and Hebrew. Chapter 22 22, Paul gives his testimony before the Jews so that they might hear the gospel of grace and believe. Unfortunately, the Jews stop him before he gets to finish speaking. Acts 9, 22, and 26 all give the same account of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. This shows how important the story is because it begins the dispensation of grace. 22, 1-2 Paul's heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, Romans 10 verse 1. This is the purpose for which he went to Jerusalem, even though he knew he would be bound and afflicted. Paul now has his opportunity to address his fellow Jews. Note how the Jews kept the more silence, 22, colon 2, when they heard him speak in Hebrew. This shows that they had not examined the facts. If they knew that he was in the temple for seven days with four fellow Jews because they all had taken the Nazarite vow, they would have known that he is a Jew. Instead, they just followed what the Jewish religious leaders wanted them to do, which was to drag him out of the temple and try to kill him. Paul cleverly speaks in Hebrew so that they know that he is a Jew. Therefore, they are now listening to him. It is for this opportunity to speak to a large Jewish audience that Paul was willingly bound and afflicted in Jerusalem. 22, 3, the accusation against Paul is that he teacheth all men everywhere against the people, and the law, and this place, and further brought Greeks also into the temple, and hath polluted this holy place, 21, 28. This is a false accusation in every respect. He is pro-Jew as evidenced by his being willing to die to reach the Jews with the gospel, 21.13. He is pro-law, as evidenced by taking a Nazarite vow, 18.18. He is pro-temple, as evidenced by taking four Jews into the temple with him and staying there seven days to fulfill their vows, 21.26-27. Therefore, Paul easily could have said, the accusation against me is not true. I was in the temple because I was keeping the law by completing a Nazarite vow, and I have four witnesses here with me, which is greater than the two witnesses required under the law. Therefore, let me go. However, Paul does not even address the matter at hand, i.e., his own innocence. Rather, Paul wants to give the gospel to the Jews. He is not concerned about his own well-being. Therefore, he speaks words so that the Jews might believe in Jesus' death as atonement for their sins. Paul starts off by telling the Jews of the credentials that they would be impressed with. This shows them that he used to be in the same boat as them, as he is very knowledgeable in the law and used to rely upon his fulfillment of the law for his salvation. Note that Paul does not say that he was taught the perfect manner of God's law. Rather, he says that he was taught the perfect manner of the law of the fathers. He says in Galatians 1 verse 14 that he was more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of his fathers. Therefore, he was zealous toward God, 22, 3, in the sense that he tried to obey God through the Jewish religion. Because he was relying on tradition rather than God's word, he did not believe the gospel of the kingdom that John the Baptist and Jesus presented to Israel. This means that he was faithful to the Jewish religion, as these Jews are, but his actions toward God were really the result of ignorant unbelief in God, 1 Timothy 1 verse 13. When Paul realized his ignorance, he believed the gospel and was saved, as a pattern to people like those in his audience, who may also now repent of their religion and believe the gospel of grace, 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. 22 colon 4 Because he was following Jewish tradition, Paul persecuted this way unto death. The Jews, he is addressing, have just beaten him and tried to kill him because he has believed the gospel, 21 colon 31 32. Therefore, they are doing the same thing to Paul that Paul used to do to those who believed the gospel of the kingdom. 22 colon 5 Instead of calling upon witnesses to testify to his innocence, 
Paul calls upon witnesses, the high priest and the elders, to confirm that he used to beat and kill those saved by the gospel. The reason Paul does this is because he is establishing that he used to do what they are doing to him. That way, they may see that the Lord himself told Paul to stop. Then, maybe they would believe the gospel as well. 22, 6 Note that Paul says that the great light from heaven came around Paul about noon. This is the time when there is more light than at any other time of the day. The fact that this great light made those seeing it afraid, 22, 9, testifies to how blinding and powerful this great light that Paul saw was. In other words, it was such a great light that it outshone the sun at the brightest time of the day such that those who saw it were afraid. Spiritually speaking, this is a sign of how the light of God was already shining around him in the form of the believing remnant of Israel. 22,7-8 The Jews, in Paul's audience, believed that Jesus was a blasphemer, saying that he was God when he was really just a man. Paul thought this, too, before Acts 9. Note, from verse 8, that Paul knew that whoever was talking to him was the Lord. So, when he identified himself as Jesus, Paul immediately knew that Jesus is God. Perhaps Paul's audience will recognize this and believe the gospel as well. 22, 9-10 Jesus was sent unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15 verse 24. Those sheep hear Jesus' voice, John 10 verse 27. The fact that Paul heard Jesus' voice shows that he was a lost sheep as opposed to those with him, who did not hear the voice of the Lord. They saw the light, but they hate light because they do evil, while Paul welcomed the light, because he saw his sin in the light and asked the Savior, John 3 verses 19 to 21, what he could do, 22 10. 22 11, both Paul and those with him saw the great light, 22 9, yet only Paul was blinded by the glory of that light. I believe this shows the spiritual conversion of Paul. In John 9 verse 41, Jesus told the Pharisees if ye were blind, ye should have no sin, but now ye say, we see, therefore, your sin remaineth. This verse refers to the fact that they think they see spiritually because they trust in their own righteousness. If they realize that they are really spiritually blind, then they would trust in God's imputed righteousness, which means they should have no sin. Since they do not see this, their sin remaineth. Applied to Paul and those with him, we see that Paul is blinded by God, seeing that he needs God's imputed righteousness. The men with him are still trusting in their own righteousness. Therefore, they see physically, but their sin remaineth. 22.12 Ananias was a kingdom saint, since he believed the gospel of the kingdom and followed God's law covenant. He could not have been part of the body of Christ, because Paul says that he was the first to be saved into the body of Christ after Israel's program had been put on hold, 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. Paul is careful to note that Ananias had a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there. This would be important to his Jewish audience. 22, 14-15 Ananias tells Paul of three things he will receive from God. Note that it is the God of our fathers, 22:14 which tells Paul's Jewish audience that he is specifically referring to Jehovah, the God of Israel. First, he will know God's will. God's will is for all men to be saved, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. Therefore, it is not just the Jews who will be saved, as Jewish tradition taught Paul, but it is also Gentiles who are included in God's plan of salvation. Second, Paul will see that just one, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is fulfilled when the Lord Jesus Christ gave the mystery gospel to Paul, Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12. The title of that just one is significant. At the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, God declared the Gentiles guilty before God. At the time of Paul's conversion in Acts 9, God had just declared the Jews guilty before God in Acts 7 with their stoning of Stephen. He did these things as the just one. Now that God hath concluded them all in unbelief, he might have mercy upon all, Romans 11 verse 32. Therefore, the just one's declaration of guilt of the whole world before him allows the whole world to now be saved through him, which is why the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile has now come. 
down, Ephesians 2 verse 14. Finally, the third thing Paul receives from God is to hear the voice of his mouth. This means that he will hear the word. Specifically, he heard the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, Romans 16 verse 25. Part of that mystery is the revelation that God wants all men to be saved. This is accomplished by God first, concluding all men in unbelief, which he finished doing in Acts 7. Now, all men have the opportunity to be saved through belief in the mystery that had been kept secret until revealed to Paul, 22:15. That is why Jesus told Paul that he would bear Jesus' name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, 9:15. 2216 Why tarriest thou? 2216 God is long suffering, not willing that any should perish. 1 Peter 3 verse 9. At the same time, now that he has started the plan to save all men through the gospel of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, God wants Paul to get a move on. A dispensation of the gospel has been specifically committed unto Paul. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17. And so he needs to start dispensing the gospel so that the world may be saved. We should note that, although Paul was the first saved by the mystery gospel, 1 Timothy 1 verse 16, the mystery was not revealed until Christ revealed it to Paul between verses 22 and 23 of Acts. 9. After all, Paul heard the mystery gospel directly from Jesus Christ, Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12. Therefore, Ananias did not know the mystery gospel and had to have given Paul the only gospel he knew, the gospel of the kingdom. That gospel was to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, 238. That is why water. Baptism was required, at this time, for his sins to be washed away. After the mystery was revealed to him, he was saved by that program as well, making him the first to be saved by the mystery gospel. 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. The fact that he was first saved by the gospel of the kingdom may explain his passion for the Jews to be saved. Romans 9 verse 3 and 10 colon 1. 22 colon 17 dash 18 these verses tell us why Paul did not reach the Jerusalem Jews immediately after he was saved. It was because God had quickly sent him away from Israel. But now that he has preached to many of the Gentiles, Paul has come back to Jerusalem to preach the gospel of grace to the Jews. 22, 19 19-20 Religion loves you when you are on their side, but they want to destroy you when you leave them, even if you leave them for God. 22:21 Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13, as opposed to the twelve apostles, who were sent only to Israel, not to the Gentiles, Matthew 10 verses 5-6. Therefore, the Lord sent Paul far hence unto the Gentiles. Saved Israel was supposed to be a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6, but they did not believe, Hebrews 3 verse 19. When the Lord called Paul in Acts 9, it is as if he said to Israel, you think you are so great in your own self-righteousness. I will show you. I will get one man to do the work that the whole nation refused to do. 2222 The Jews. Listen to Paul until he said that God sent him to the Gentiles. Such a statement is worthy of death in their minds, as they still think they are God's chosen people, and the Gentiles are the scum of the earth. They do not give Paul the chance to explain the new dispensation of grace by which they may receive eternal life. Once Paul says one thing that goes against their traditions, they stop listening to him and call for his execution. Therefore, they have rejected the gospel before even hearing it. That is what religion does. It seeks to silence immediately anyone who speaks a single word against it. That is why it is a lot harder to share the gospel with religious people than with wicked people. 2223 Crying out, casting off their clothes, and throwing dust in the air is everything they could do to show their displeasure with Paul. They could not kill him because he was in Roman custody. This shows how proud the Jews are of their religion that they think that a person who claims that God sent him to preach to the Gentiles should be killed. How dare Paul seek to bring Gentile dogs into God's eternal kingdom? 2224 Evidentially, the chief captain does not understand Hebrew. 2140 
and so he does not know why the Jews want Paul killed, especially since he does not appear to have done anything wrong. He decides to beat him. In so doing, he hopes both to appease the Jews and to find out what Paul did that got them so enraged. This is not unlike Pilate's tactic with Jesus, Mark 15 verse 15. 2225, because Paul is a Roman citizen, he has the right to a fair trial. Paul did not mention this before because he wanted to share the gospel with the Jews. However, now that the Jews have stopped listening, Paul mentions his Roman citizenship so as to gain another opportunity to preach the gospel. This time, he will speak to all of the high-ranking Jewish religious people without having to worry about them killing him, because he will be in a Roman court. 2228 Apparently, those born in Rome were automatically Roman citizens. Others had to purchase Roman citizenship. Paul belongs in the former category, while the chief captain is in the latter category. This also pictures the two spiritual categories of Jews here. Paul was freeborn spiritually because he believed the gospel. The Jewish religious leaders are trying to buy their way into God's kingdom by obeying their religious system, which will never be enough to purchase eternal life. Only Jesus shed blood on the cross satisfied the wrath of God in purchasing eternal life for all who believe whatever gospel God has given them. 2229 Remember that they were going to examine Paul by scourging him. 2224 Therefore, this verse is saying that they will not scourge him, because he is a Roman citizen. 2230 Still, the chief captain needs to find out why the Jews are so upset at Paul. Therefore, he commands all of the Jewish council to appear the next day for Paul's defense. You can bet that Paul prayed that night for the opportunity to speak the gospel the next day to the top Jewish religious leaders. Chapter 23 23 Paul gets to speak to the religious leaders about Christ's resurrection, but not for long. Due to the ruckus created, Paul is taken into protective custody and then shipped off to the governor to be tried there. 23 1 1-2 The high priest commanded Paul to be smitten on the face. Therefore, although the chief captain of the Roman court has ordered this hearing, he is allowing the Jewish leaders to be in charge. Paul states his innocence, and he is struck on the mouth by the Jews. They have punished a man of whom they have no proof of wrongdoing. Leviticus 19 verse 15 says, Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, which commandment they have broken. This shows how unjust the Jewish religious leaders are. This shows why Jesus said that the Pharisees had omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith, Matthew 23 verse 23. 23 colon 3 dash 5, Paul says he has lived in all good conscience before God until this day, 23 colon 1. In Philippians 3 verse 6, he says that he was blameless according to the law. The top Jewish religious leaders do not have such a testimony because they have smitten Paul before he has been sentenced, which is contrary to the law, 23, 3, Leviticus 19 verse 15. In spite of their injustice, Paul maintains his blamelessness under the law, as he will not speak evil of the high priest anymore, because this is contrary to the law, even though the high priest is not following the law himself, Exodus 22 verse 28. Therefore, right away, we can see that the Jewish religious leaders are the guilty ones here, not Paul. Paul uses the term whited wall in reference to the high priest because he typifies what Jesus said about the Jewish religious leaders in Matthew 23 verse 27, Ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. This shows that Paul recognizes that the book of Matthew which had been written at least 15 years prior, is scripture, while the Jewish leaders only recognize the Old Testament as scripture. An interesting point is that Paul did not know that Ananias was the high priest. In 22, 5, he says that, before Acts 9, he had received letters from the high priest to arrest believers. Paul says, in Philippians 3 verses 7 to 8, that, with regard to his former life, he counted all things lost for Christ. This statement is true because not only did he give up his wealth and power in the Jewish religion, but he also failed to keep up with 
changes in that religion, such that he did not even know that there was a new, high priest. This also may explain why he earnestly beheld the council, 23, colon 1. He was probably looking to see who had left the Jewish religion since the dispensation of grace started. This is a lesson for us that we do not need to take an apologetic class and learn about other denominations slash cults in order to reach those people for Christ, as most Christians think. Rather, Paul said, Yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil, Romans 16 verse 19. Unfortunately, many Christians would much rather learn about Christian beliefs than to be removed from their ignorance regarding sound doctrine for today as seen by Paul's fivefold admonition of ignorance in his epistles, Romans 1 13, 11, 25, I Corinthians 10, 1, 12, 1, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13, 23, 6 In the current, grace dispensation, salvation is by trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 17. Therefore, Christ's resurrection is vital to the gospel. Therefore, by mentioning his preaching of the resurrection of the dead, Paul is both dividing his accusers and finding a way to preach the gospel in a courtroom setting. 23 colon 8. The grammar of this verse tells us that neither angel nor spirit refers to resurrection. However, the modern translations change this to read that the Sadducees do not even believe that angels and spirits exist. Using the correct translation, we can deduce that angel refers to the body, because an angel has the form of a man, Revelation 21 verse 17. Therefore, the Sadducees believe that there is no resurrection of the spirit or of the body, while the Pharisees believe both are true. Again. This shows that the religious leaders trusted in Jewish tradition, rather than in the Word of God, because resurrection is essential to God's keeping of His promises to Israel's forefathers, and bodily resurrection is seen in the Old Testament, e.g., 1 Kings 17 verses 21 to 22 and 2 Kings 4 verses 34 to 35. Therefore, the Sadducees do not believe the Word of God, not even the Old Testament. 23, 9 Although the Pharisees take Paul's side, their comment shows that they do not believe Paul. Paul received his instructions directly from the Lord Jesus Christ, Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12. Since the Pharisees had Jesus crucified, they refused to believe that his doctrine comes directly from God. Therefore, they say that a spirit or an angel hath spoken to him with the implication that sound doctrine can come from a spirit or an angel. Funny how nothing has changed in the last 2,000 years, as people today say, God spoke to me, or I feel impressed that God wants me to underscore 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 dot. If you give them sound doctrine from Paul's epistles, they turn their itching ears away unto fables that make them feel all warm and fuzzy inside, 2 Timothy 4 verses 3 to 4. However, in God's written word, he has already abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, Ephesians 1 verse 8. Therefore, we should be guided solely by the Bible rightly divided, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, rather than by inner impressions from a spirit or an angel, 23 colon 9. 23 10, you can visualize Paul being pulled in one direction by the Sadducees and in another direction by the Pharisees. Again, Roman authority has to step in to keep Paul from being killed by Jewish religious adherents. The great thing about this is that, for safety reasons, he is brought to the castle of the Romans, which gives him the opportunity to preach the gospel to a different audience. 2311, Paul's desire was to go to Jerusalem to preach the gospel to all Jews, both the common Jews and the religious leaders. Through Jewish opposition, he was able to preach to both. Although they cut him short both times, they at least had the opportunity if they would have listened to him. Most Christians would probably view Paul as a moron for going to Jerusalem even though he knew he would be arrested. What good did it do? Is the attitude. Paul, on the other hand, viewed it as a tremendous opportunity. Instead of having to preach in the Jewish synagogue for three months like he did in Ephesus, 19, 8, 
and Greece, 20, 3. Before moving on to the next city, the persecution in Jerusalem gave Paul the audience he wanted in just a matter of days. Now, Paul gets the good news that he will not die, but that he will go to Rome and preach the gospel there. What a blessing! This also flies in the face of the theory that Paul will make a stupid move later on when he appeals to Caesar, 25, 11-12. Doing so got him a free trip to Rome to preach the gospel. Paul shows that, when you recognize for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain, Philippians 1 verse 20, your perspective is completely different from the world's perspective and from most Christians' perspective, as well. Also, from how Paul got a free trip to Rome, we can see how the gospel of the kingdom will go to the whole world during the tribulation period, Matthew 24 verse 14, even though the believing remnant is only supposed to go to the cities of Israel, Matthew 10, 5-6, 23, 23, 12-13 The fact that more than 40 Jews vow to kill Paul before they eat or drink shows their great opposition of him. They know that Paul was a top man in their religious system before he was saved, 22, 3. This means that he knows how evil they are. He knows all of their dirty laundry. That is why most want him killed. They do not want him exposing their corrupt religious system and influence over the common Jews. Most men, in Paul's situation, would have tried to blackmail their way out. However, Paul is not concerned about preserving his own life or of exalting himself over the Jewish religion. He only cares about sharing the gospel. Therefore, that is all he tries to do. He does not cut a deal. And now that the Lord has told Paul that he will not be killed in Jerusalem, Paul has no fear over the oath that these Jewish men made, because he trusts God's word over man's word. 23, 14-15 These Jewish religious leaders do not care one bit about obeying the law. This is shown in the fact that those who made a vow to kill Paul get the Jewish religious council in on their plan. The Jewish religious council is the law in their religion, and they have the power to stone people for disobeying the law. John 8 verse 59 and 1031. Plotting to kill someone according to God's law is enough to execute them, as Jesus said in Matthew 5 verses 21 to 22. Their boldness, then, in going to the Jewish religious council with something that they should be put to death for, shows that the Jewish religious leaders do not obey the law. Their number one goal is to kill Paul, not to bring him justice. They tried to kill Paul at first, 2131. Then, when the Romans interfered, they went along to have him convicted by trial. Now that the Romans are protecting Paul, they devise a way to slay him. God's law says that doing so makes them worthy of being killed themselves. Numbers 35, 16-18. But they do not care about that, because they think that they are above the law. If the Romans did not interfere, Paul would have been killed a long time ago. Think, now, about the tribulation period when the Antichrist will be in charge. With the Antichrist being the world ruler from Jerusalem for the last half of the tribulation period, there will be no stopping the killing of believing Israel at that time. That is why Jesus tells the believing remnant that, when the Antichrist sets up the image of the beast in the temple, they are to flee to the mountains, Matthew 24 verses 15 to 16. 23 16 Since Paul used to be a top, religious leader himself, it makes sense that a member of his family would be in the council or would at least have the connections to find out about their plot to kill Paul. 23 17-22 Paul's nephew helps Paul avoid being killed by the Jews. As such, he is a type of the Gentiles who bless the little flock, giving them food, clothing, and shelter, during the Antichrist's reign of terror, Matthew 25 verses 34 to 40. 23, 23-24 The chief captain has seen that the Jews are up to no good, and so he believes Paul's nephew, realizing that Paul's life is in danger. Although he still does not know why the Jews want him dead, he does not want to get in trouble with his superiors for not protecting a Roman from being unjustly killed by a bunch of thugs. Therefore, he outnumbers the Jews lying in wait by more than 10 to 1. Paul is taken to the governor, 
which means he will get to preach to yet another audience. Therefore, Paul is probably thrilled at all of the moving around that is happening. 2327 This is not entirely true. Claudius Lysias did not know initially that Paul was a Roman, 22-25-27. The real reason he arrested Paul was to keep a riot from happening, 21-31-32. 2328 In all of this, the chief captain still never found out why the Jews want to kill Paul. Chapter 24 24 The Jews falsely accuse Paul before the governor verses 2 to 9, which is obvious to the governor. However, because the governor loves money more than justice, he leaves Paul in jail for two years, verses 25 to 27. That is fine with Paul, though, because it means he gets to preach the gospel there for two years. 24, colon 1, it took five days for the Jewish religious leaders to lawyer up. With Tertullus, their ancient day equivalent of Johnny Cochran, O.J. Simpson's lawyer, now with them, they are in court ready to connive to get Paul sentenced to death. 24, 2-4, no harm in buttering up the judge, before talking of the case at hand. 24, 5, the best charge the Jews can produce against Paul is that he is a pest who tries to get people to rebel against the government. This is a terrible argument because they have no evidence to support their argument, but it is the best they can do because Paul is blameless under the law, Philippians 3 verse 6. They try to make Paul look bad by making up a name for his teachings. They call him of the sect of the Nazarenes. No doubt this name is derived from his following Jesus of Nazareth. However, the name is comical because Nazareth were the first people who tried to kill Jesus, Luke 4, 16, 24, 28-29, 24, 6-7 Their next accusation is that Paul profaned the temple, meaning that he brought a Gentile into the inner court. Of course, they have no evidence that he did this, 21, 28-29, and this is also something the Roman governor would not care about in the slightest, since it breaks no Roman law. Like All good lawyers, Tertullus is lying. The Jewish religious leaders did not casually arrest Paul and judge him according to their law. Rather, they were about to kill Paul without a trial, 2131, and the reason the Romans got involved was because they were beating him, 2132. When Paul gives his defense, he could point this out, but he will not, because he is only concerned with preaching the gospel. He does not care about his innocence. 24, 9, this short sentence shows the wickedness of the top, Jewish, religious leaders, 24, 1. The religious leaders and Tertullus had planned in advance what they would say, making them both guilty of conspiracy to murder since they have lied in order to try to get a death verdict from Felix. However, nothing will happen to them since Felix is just as corrupt as they are. 2400 hours, 26. 2400 hours, 10, under Roman law, Paul had the right to an attorney to defend him, but he chose to defend himself. That is because he wants to preach the gospel, and a lawyer would just try to free him. 24, 11-13 in three verses, Paul says that their allegations are false. Then, in the next two verses, he will cover the real issue. 24, 14-15 in just two short verses, Paul conveys that, 1, Christianity is not a new religion. Rather, it is a continuation of God's word found in the Old Testament. 2. The only way to believe all things which are written in the law and in the prophets is to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is Israel's Messiah, come to save them from their sins, as prophesied in the Old Testament. 3. Resurrection from the dead for man to receive eternal life from God comes by believing in Jesus' resurrection, being the first fruits of the resurrection. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. I, Corinthians 15:23. Perhaps Felix is not able to put all of these pieces together from Paul's two verses, but the Jewish religious leaders know enough to figure these things out if they really wanted to know the truth. Therefore, even in a Roman court, Paul is still preaching the gospel to Jerusalem Jews. 
2400 hour 16, your conscience says that you are guilty before God. The only way to purge this guilty conscience is being saved by the blood of Christ. Hebrews 9 verse 14. The first step toward being saved is to recognize what your guilty conscience tells you, which is that you are a sinner. Romans 3 verses 9 to 12. Therefore, by twice, here and in 23, colon 1, telling his accusers that his conscience is clear before God, Paul is trying to get the Jews to take that first step toward being saved. 2400 hours 17 Paul came to Jerusalem to preach the gospel to the Jews, but Paul says that he came to bring alms. Alms are anything given for nothing to help the poor or needy. Spiritually speaking, that is exactly what Paul did. He gave charity, 1 Corinthians 13, to the Jews spiritually by giving them the gospel of grace so that they might have eternal life, which they did not have, being poor spiritually. The offerings that he brought would be of his body as a living sacrifice to God, Romans 12 verse 1. Therefore, Paul is telling the truth when he says that he came to Jerusalem to bring alms and offerings. 2400 hours 18 The Jews defiled a purified man, Paul, by taking him out of the temple before his days of purification were accomplished, 21, 27, 30, and yet the Jews are the ones accusing Paul of defiling the temple by bringing Gentiles in there. Similarly, Paul is pure in the sight of God because he has believed the gospel, but the Jews say that they are righteous in God's sight when they are the real guilty ones. 2400 hours 19, the people, who threw Paul out of the temple, are not there in person. That is because they are guilty of attempted murder, 21, 28-31, and so they are afraid of appearing before the court, lest they be condemned. 2400 hours 21, Paul tells Felix that the real reason he is on trial is because he believes that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, offering the same to all who believe on him. Therefore, Paul is on trial for preaching the gospel. You may think this is not true, and that it is just a clever way for Paul to present the gospel. However, it really is the resurrection life in Christ that is the reason Paul is there. After all, if Christ did not rise from the dead, there would be no power in the gospel, Paul would not be saved, and he would not be preaching. He would still be in the Jewish religion. Even if he did abandon the Jewish religion, there would be no reason for them to arrest Paul, because his message would not pose a threat to them without the resurrection because there would be no saving power behind it. 24, 22-23 Felix probably calls for the chief captain, Claudius Lysias, because the Jews have accused him of interfering in their law process, 24, 6-8 and so Felix wants to hear Lysias' side of the story. Felix has already determined that Paul is innocent, having more perfect knowledge of that way now, 2400 hours 22. Therefore, he gives Paul some liberties while in jail, which is perfect for Paul. He does not have to work for a living because everything is provided for him, and he has the liberty to preach the gospel and to study God's word while there. 24, 24-26, for the Jews to have such hatred for Paul and such. Scheming against him, Felix probably figured there must be something to the gospel he preaches. Therefore, he calls Paul, and Paul shares the gospel of grace with him and his wife. The gospel had such a profound effect on Felix that he literally trembled. The devils also tremble at God, James 2 verse 19. So, this, in itself, does not mean he was saved. Nevertheless, he loved money more than eternal life, therefore, he kept Paul bound and sent for him many times, in hopes that Paul would bribe his way out of jail, much like the Jewish religious leaders undoubtedly did when the chief captain came and testified that they had lied about their treatment of Paul, 2400 hours 22. 2400 hours 27, since the Jews paid Felix money and Paul did not, Paul stayed in prison for two years. For Paul, that meant that he had the opportunity to preach the gospel to all those in the governor's house for two years. After all, he was given liberty to have anyone come to him, 2400 hours 23. Therefore, 
Paul must have shared the gospel with all employees and all prisoners during that time. That is not a bad deal for Paul, since he got free room and board while he had to work as a tent maker in order to make ends meet while. He was traveling from city to city preaching the gospel before, e.g., 18,3 and 20,33-34. Therefore, he could devote all of his energies to God's will for all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, chapter 25. 25 Paul is tried before Festus, and the Jews try to bribe Festus into releasing Paul to Jerusalem so that the Jews can kill him in transport, verses 2 to 3. Paul stops this from happening by appealing to Caesar, verses 10 to 11 which is how Paul will continue to testify of the Lord Jesus Christ to the Romans, because his appeal keeps him from going to Jerusalem. Festus lets many days, v. 14, pass, before sending him to Caesar, because he does not have a good reason for him being held, verses 26 to 27. This delay just gives Paul more opportunities to preach the gospel of grace to those around him, 25, 1-3 Paul has been in prison for two years, and the Jews are still chomping at the bit to get their hands on him and kill him. You would think that having him in prison all of that time would have been sufficient for the Jews, but so desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17 verse 9, is the flesh that they want the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13, killed. Another factor is that Paul has probably had an effective prison ministry. Paul is allowed to have whomever he wants to visit him, 2400 hours 23, and so you can just picture Paul's jail cell being the new, grace headquarters to which Timothy, Luke, Silas, Barnabas, etc., are coming to get details of mystery doctrine, ministry advice, and instructions to deliver to churches. The Jews probably thought they would get rid of the grace message by having Paul arrested, but they really helped his ministry. Therefore, they still want Paul. Dead. 25, 4-5 Festus wants to make sure that, if Paul is punished, it is because he has done something against Roman law. Therefore, he tells the Jews to come to Caesarea to try him if he has done anything wrong. Still, the Jews do have some sway with the Romans since both Felix and Festus want to do the Jews a pleasure, 2400 hours 27 and 25 colon 9. Therefore, the Jews have at least some political influences in Rome. 25 colon 6 7 The Jews go with Festus to Caesarea, where Paul is. They have had two years to produce reasons that Paul should be killed. Therefore, they laid many and grievous complaints against Paul. The problem was that Paul was innocent, therefore, they could not prove that any of their complaints were true. This proves what Paul said in Philippians 3 verse 6 that, in touching the righteousness which is in the law, he was blameless. 25, 8 The Jews' complaints against Paul must have included that he disobeyed Jewish law, profaned the temple, and incited a rebellion against Caesar, because Paul said that he was innocent of all those things. 25, 9-11 and 25, 4, Festus would not let Paul be taken to Jerusalem to be tried. He made the Jewish religious leaders come to Caesarea. The reason is because Jerusalem is where the Jews judge people, while Caesarea is where the Romans judge people. Therefore, it makes no sense for Festus to ask Paul to go to Jerusalem to be judged in front of Festus. This tells us that, since the Jewish religious leaders could not prove any of their accusations, they must have offered Festus a bribe to bring Paul to Jerusalem so that they could kill him in transit. Paul must have known that he would be killed by the Jews if he was transported to Jerusalem, just like they plotted to do before. As a Roman citizen, Paul could avoid this trip to Jerusalem by appealing to Caesar. Plus, this gives Paul the further opportunity to bear witness of God in Rome, as the Lord had told him he would do, 2311. This shows that Paul was suffering unjustly at the hands of Festus, which means that Agrippa's statement, in 26, 32, is incorrect, when he states, this man might have been set at liberty, if he had not appealed unto Caesar. 
25, 25,12 Festus probably conferred with the council to see if there was any legal way he could get out of sending Paul to Rome so that he could send him to Jerusalem and receive the bribe from the Jewish religious leaders. With no legal way out, Festus sends Paul to Caesar. 25, 13-14 King Agrippa was a king of the Jews, being a descendant of Herod. Since Paul is a Jew and the Jews are up in arms about Paul, Festus tells Agrippa about Paul. Note that 25, 13 says that Agrippa came to Caesarea after certain days, and 25, 14 says that he had been there many days. This shows that, even though Paul had appealed to Caesar and Festus had granted his request, Festus was stalling as long as he could because he wanted that bribe. So, even after his appeal to Caesar, both certain days and many days pass, and Paul has still not gone to Caesar. 25, 16 Now, we get a little more information about the Jews' request in 25, 2-3 to have Paul sent to Jerusalem. They did not just want a Roman trial conducted there, but the Jews wanted to judge Paul themselves so that they could sentence him to death by stoning. Of course, they would have killed Paul before he ever got to Jerusalem. However, they cannot do this since Paul is also a Roman, giving him the right to a fair trial in a Roman court. 25, 18 This shows that Festus is not a religious man. He assumed that Paul must have committed a crime that was against the law, such as murder, in order for the Jews to want him dead. The Jews' main accusation was that Paul said that Jesus rose from the dead when the Jews said that he had not risen from the dead. 25, 19 Surely, if Jesus were still in the ground, this would have been an open and shut case, but the Jews could not prove 25, 7, their case against Paul. This should be proof positive to all people today that Jesus rose from the dead. After all, the Jews had Jesus killed, 26, 65-66, and they had guards posted at his grave, 27, 64-66. If he were still in the ground, everyone would know it. Then, if Paul said that Jesus rose from the dead, everyone in Jerusalem would have quickly labeled Paul as a loon, and no one would have listened to him. Instead, Paul had turned the world upside down, 17, 6, by preaching the resurrection, and the Jerusalem Jews could not prove Paul wrong, even though Jesus was buried just outside of Jerusalem. Therefore, Jesus must have, beyond the shadow of a doubt, risen from the dead. 25, 19 Festus rightly refers to the Jewish religious system as superstition, which means that their system of beliefs has no basis in fact. Paul had said that those in Athens were too superstitious, 1722. This term applies to all man-made religion, including the Jews' following of the traditions of the elders and Christianity's following of their own traditions today, which are not based on the truth of God's word. The Jews also accused Paul of his belief that Jesus is alive. This shows that, when Paul said that he was on trial for believing in resurrection, 23, 6, they all knew that he was talking about Jesus' resurrection from the dead, which means that they knew the gospel that he was preaching. The bottom line is that the Jews knew that Paul's gospel is true, but admitting that would destroy their religion. Therefore, they would rather kill an innocent man than to admit to the truth. Note. Also that Festus says that Jesus was dead, 25, 19. He does not say that Jesus is dead. Perhaps Festus believes Paul. After all, Festus must have known of the events that took place in Jerusalem and that Jesus was reported to have risen from the dead. Any rational man would conclude that Jesus must have risen from the dead, or else there would be no reason for the Jews to want to kill Paul. 25, 20-21 Festus doubted the manner of Questions, which means that the way in which the Jews asked Paul questions led Festus to believe that the Jews did not have good intentions. Yet, he is willing to release Paul to the Jews to judge him in Jerusalem. In other words, because of the Jews' political influence, Festus wants to do them a pleasure. 25, 9. Therefore, he is willing to turn his back and let the Jews do what they want to with Paul, including killing him. 
Then, if anyone ever questions Festus about it, he can plead ignorance so that he does not get in trouble. Hmm. Festus sounds no different from the corrupt government officials we deal with today. Paul knew what was going on, which is why he appealed to Caesar. 25, 23, Paul got to share the gospel. 1, with the common Jews, Acts 22, 2, with the Jewish religious leaders and the Roman chief captain in Jerusalem, Acts 23, 3, with those in the Roman castle in Jerusalem, 23, 10, 4, with Felix and his court, Acts 24, 5, for two years in Felix's castle, 2400 hours 27, 6, with Festus and his court, 25, 6-12, and now 7, with King Agrippa and those in the place of hearing, 25, 23. King Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and the principal men of the city were there, as well, 25, 23. This means that Paul's speech before King Agrippa was probably a front-page headline. Therefore, the Jews' effort to stop the gospel of grace from going out from Paul in Jerusalem is actually causing the spread of the gospel to many Jews and Gentiles in both Jerusalem and Caesarea. 25, 25 Caesar. Augustus died in 14 AD. Therefore, this Augustus, before whom Festus will bring Paul, is not the Caesar. Rather, he is a lower-ranking official in the Caesar's government. 25, 26-27 Festus has a problem. Paul has appealed to Caesar. The higher court needs good reason why Paul is on trial. Yet, after over two years of being in prison, there is still no certain thing to write regarding any wrongdoing that Paul had done. Therefore, King Agrippa examines him to see if he can find a serious charge on which to bring Paul to the higher court. 